offered this opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Building up from our message from last week, we're going to still be teaching through the book of Revelation. Why are we speaking through Revelation at this time? I truly believe we're living in the last days where God is moving and the events of the Bible are coming to fold and we're seeing day by day how God is moving and his work is moving through the land. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see destruction. We see unnatural affection. Families are breaking down on every side. But we also see the word of God reaching all mankind so that mankind can see and know the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, picking up, we've covered thus far. You go back to our first church we covered. The first church given in the book of Revelation, the first chapter, was the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a little different but when the Ephesus was a church that God was excited about Ephesus, he loved the way they carried out the mission of God. But God also had an awe with Ephesus because he said you had left your first love. We moved a little further. We went down to the church of Smyrna. Smyrna was an awesome situation. It, it, it was beautiful. It was a, a church that loved God, but, but Smyrna also had a problem. They loved the applause of man as much as they loved God. And God said, if you're going to do work, you got to be authentic. So not only is God calling the church to work, but he's calling us to be authentic. The third church was Pergamos. Pergamos was a different one when God started off the text. And God said that he reminded us that he was still the two-edged sword. There is blessings in a two-edged sword if you know Jesus for one, God is that sword that comforts us and shields us and protects us. But he's also that sword that, that cuts back the enemy and he avenges our fights for us. So God is an awesome God. And, and today we're going to be dealing with the church of Thyatira. Beginning at Revelation, the second chapter, verse 18, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things said the Son of God, who has his eyes like the flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things, sacrifice unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with, it, with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will give her children with death, and all of the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts that I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I'll put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. Lord have mercy, and the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, which, which he had heaven here. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. I want to talk to you today about an early morning blessing. An early morning blessing. Dear Lord, we thank you today. We praise you. We lift up your holy name. God, move in a mighty way. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Father, bless us. We are worshiping from home. Give strength and power and might, love, sound mind. Keep us on every side, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. John, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, was once again dealing with another message to the church. And the church of Thyatira carries a powerful message because, one, the church reminds us that God always had a plan for all of the nations. Thyatira was introduced to the gospel. If you can recall the story when Paul and Silas were preaching and teaching the words of Jesus and there was a lady named Lydia, seller of purple, that followed them around. She was used by many to, to deal sorcery and she was used as a token. While many Jews had had their way and Lydia heard Paul and Silas preaching the gospel and the Bible says that Lydia got saved and went back and led her whole household 
to know Christ. What was so powerful about Lydia giving her life to Christ was Lydia was the first European that was given in the Bible that there was a recount where the gospel was spread first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, and then the word went over to Europe and God was sharing the word. Now the power of this reminds us also that many in European nations believe that they gave the gospel to folks first. You didn't give the gospel to anybody first. God was around from day one and God has a plan that the whole world can receive the gospel, whether in Asia, whether in the Middle East, whether in Europe, whether in the Western Hemisphere, North America, South America, no matter where we are, God God is long suffering that his word can go forth. But when God began to speak to the church here at Thyatira, look how God introduced himself. He says, these things says the son of God who has eyes, eyes like the flames of fire and his feet are like fine brass. First of all, who can look at us with eyes that can see beyond the thoughts and the imagination, can see beyond the skin and, and all of the, the human extremities, can see beyond all of their earthly behaviors and look at us and see the soul and the condition of man. It takes eyes that have flames of fire that control the world that hold things in its place. There's no body but Jesus. Then he goes that feet are like fine brass. It reminds me of the story of the three Hebrew boys where they put them in the fire Fire and the fire was so strong that it burned the men that opened up the furnace. It sensed all of the things that were around them. But when the young men came out, they didn't smell like fire. They did not smell like smoke. It's impossible to cook on the grill without having a little charcoal smell if you're really doing a good cooking. It's impossible for something to burn in the kitchen and for something to burn on the grill if you're doing a good job without having a little smoke on you every now and then. But this was a situation where God had shielded those boys and when the king had his men look down and said who do you see in there? He said I thought we put three in there but it looked like I see four for the son of man looks like the son of man and the son of God was marching down there the inside so Daniel equated him as having feet that are shown for the fire like brass which equates to the ancient of days that God that will never lose his power never lose his strength never lose his might, never lose his order and then God go on and start helping the church God said I know your works been working hard for the Lord I, I know your charity you're giving to the best of your service trying to help people those in positions of power trying to pay people right those are trying to make a difference in life the church trying to sow seeds to help those hearts out church ought not be the cheapest act in town y'all we ought to lead in charity because God loves charity then it says and I know your service the things that you do for the mission of God I'm not talking about having your name title being called the mission I'm just talking about when there is something for thy foot to do, something for thy hand to do, do it with all that might and know that God will make a way somehow. He said, I even know your faith. I know that there are some that are working without faith. There's some that are working with little faith, but every now and then you'll meet a Christian on that journey that's working for the Lord, that got a strong faith. I'm talking about a faith that's saying it may not look right now, but God's going to fix it somehow. A faith that says there are difficult times in the land, but God is going to fix it somehow. A faith that says politically things are falling apart on every side, but I'm not going to rely on man. My power is not found in the next election, but my my power is found when I take my faith and I fall down on my knees and I cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He said, I know thy faith. He goes a little further. He said, but not only do I know your faith, I know your patience. <clears throat> there is something powerful about having a little patience. I like the old time saying when they start talking about the goodness of the Lord, when the old folk would say, he may not come when you want him, but he sure enough come right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. And then it goes a little further. God said, with all of these things, I got something else I like about you. He said, thy patience. And then he says, thy works again, because it was given with a stanza, because God said, your last to be greater than your first. What that simply means right there is as we've been on the Lord's side, we ought to be getting better every day. 
Every day I walk with the Lord, I ought to be growing stronger. Every day we ought to not be growing old and mean. We ought not be growing as long-term Christians create mess. But every day the Lord bless us, we ought to get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Why? Because if God abide in us and we, we in him, we can ask whatever it is in his name and it shall be given. And the last I heard about my Jesus was he sweet I know. Yes, he's sweet I know. So if we're walking in the image of God, we ought not be getting ornery and upset and attituded and moody and stuck in our ways. But we ought to be getting nicer and sweeter as we go along because the Lord is sweeter and sweeter and sweeter every day. But then it goes a little further. He said, I like that. He said, you're not preaching the same as you used to preach. You're not talking about the same things that you used to talk. It's amazing that you've been singing in the choir for 20 and 30 years when it's time to have an argument. You ought to be the last one to argue. How can you be arguing when you've been singing all your life? Lift every voice and sing till offering heaven rain. How can you be arguing when you've been singing all your life? Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. How can you be mad about something when you've been singing about God's grace, God's grace. It brought me, it taught me, they told me I wasn't going to make it, told me I wouldn't be here today, but guess what church, I'm still holding on when you've been singing those songs of Zion, talking about Lord, feel this temple, Lord, feel this place in this very room. We ought to be so excited that before an argument can even take stand, somebody ought to stand up and say, I want to hear what the word of the Lord say before folk can lead you in another direction. You ought to say, well, let me see what my Bible got to say about that. That's why I'm excited about the fundamental teaching I received as a preacher. I'm not running for an office. I'm not trying to be the voice in the newspaper. Don't care if somebody know my name when it's time to leave town. I'm just concerned that if you heard me preach, if you've seen my life, I tried to help somebody with the word of God as I traveled along, tried to cheer somebody with a word or a song, tried to show somebody they're traveling wrong so that my living shall not be in vain. But God said, I got it all against you. I'm ready to let it go. I got to let it go, but I got it all against you. He said, you've allowed and you suffered that Jezebel, that wicked Jezebel and that weak man Ahaz. You allowed them to creep into your church, he said. And this is not talking about the physical Jezebel because Jezebel was an Old Testament false prophetess that had a problem with Elijah and God's men standing up for the cause of Christ. And even Jezebel was so strong that I was rescued from a chariot. Elijah fell prey and allowed Jezebel to throw him off. But don't you know when Elijah was hiding in Mount Carmel over in a cave, afraid to come out, God had spoken to his preacher friend Obadiah. And Obadiah had planted prophets in 50 different caves and provided food and oil. And they were praying and ready. So when Elijah came out on Mount Carmel, he looked up and there were thousands coming up from every nation that had not bowed down to Baal. And God utterly destroyed Jezebel and all of her false witnesses. And what God is trying to tell the church, don't be jumping on sides with folk trying to kick against the word of God. Folk trying to kick against a Bible preaching preacher. Folk trying to kick against standing on the word of God. The church is not rooted in rules and regulations, but the church is rooted in the grace of God and the power of the scripture. The church is not rooted in what we've done in our other organizations, but it's rooted by the power of the Holy Ghost. The church is not around to be some social club that give us titles and prominence in the community, but the church is a place that although your sins be as scarlet, God will wash you and make you whiter than snow. So the word got to be the word. God's will got to be God's will. God's way got to be God's way and there can be no other way than to be love Jesus and to trust him at his word and God said the reason I let that spirit of Jezebel grow in your church I was just giving folk time to repent folk been fighting and fussing create mess on every side if you got to call somebody
somebody on the phone and explain your case. Maybe you don't have a case to stand in the eyesight of God. If you got to convince folks all around in secret meetings before the real meeting, maybe you don't have a reason to be standing up in a meeting, but when you can open up the word of God and say, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, then you got something with power. And God said, I was giving her a little time to get her stuff right. I was giving these folk in the church been fighting against the will of God, fighting against the pastor, fighting against those that are standing for truth, fighting against the will in God's way. I've been giving them a little more time to repent, but if they don't repent, God said he's going to deal with them in great tribulation. But then he goes a little further. He says, but to you who don't even know what this preacher talking about, all I do is come to church to give God some glory. God said, I, I'm not caught up in mess at the church. I'm not caught up in the politics of the church. All I want to do is give God glory. God said, that's not your problem. This is a message to those that love church meetings more than we love church mission. This is a word right here to those that love controlling with policy more than we like praying and preaching. This is a message to those that like giving up performance more than we love singing to the glory of our most God. This is about those that love to hear their name called and their name written on this, inscribed on this, instead of giving the power to the Lord God Almighty. One of my favorite excerpts from one of my favorite hymns is don't exalt the preacher and don't exalt the pew, but lift the Savior up so that men can see. And he said, if he be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. God said this right here to let you know that when you allow yourself to follow a Jezebel spirit, Satan will get inside and take you further than you ever thought you could go. He'll mess up your testimony. He'll mess up your reputation. He'll mess up your life. But God got good news for the church. If you've been broken down and you've been tossed and driven by the restless sea of time, God said if you'll just confess unto Jesus, he'll give you a new opportunity, a new life, a new joy, a new strength, a new hope. And not only will God bless you on this side, but he said, but to him who overcome it, there is a new morning star. What does it mean to have a new morning star? It means that one day I'm going to take off this earthly robe and I'm going to put on a new robe in glory. One day I'm going to take off this earthly body and I'm going to put on a new body over in glory. One day I'm going to take off this earthly sickness and I'm going to put a new all health over in glory. I'm going to leave that decaying house and I got a mansion made by my Lord with my name written on it so when he said a new morning star I'm gonna go to bed down here one day and trouble in this world gonna be over but I'm gonna wake up in the arms of Jesus with a bright and morning star don't you know he's a way maker he's a lily of the valley since he got feet like brass he's an ancient of days don't you know he's sunshine on a cloudy day don't you know that since he is my new joy that means he's my bright and early morning star. He's my everything. He's my all in all. He's my hope and he's my strength. He's my power and he's my joy. What I'm simply trying to say to the modern church today, don't let anybody turn you around. Don't let anybody twist you aside. Put your hand on the Lord's hand. Put your eyes on God's word. Set your heart to living for the Lord. Renew yourself with God Almighty and watch God clean up your life. Clean up your job, clean up your house, clean up your joy, clean up your everything because he's our all in all. Thank God that he's our bright and morning star. If you are here today and you're listening and you've never asked Christ to give you a fresh beginning, today I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Just pray with me right in your homes. And today God has promised in his word. He says that we confess our sins to Lord Jesus. Believe that he died on the cross for the sins of mankind. He will save us. He will set us free. 
What are you talking about preaching? Scriptures in Romans makes it clearly. As it is written, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. But God so commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. And the part I like is over in Romans 10 chapter 13 where he said, if we believe, if we trust him, all we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and we shall be saved. That's the fundamental truth of the gospel. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. And no matter how bad your life may be, God is saying today, if you will reach out and give it to him, he'll give you a fresh start. Let us pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, pray right now that you reach every home, reach every heart, reach every ear. Right now, Father, we pray that that individual that feels they're far from you today, you forgive that person of their sins. Give them a brand new fresh start in Christ Jesus. Become their partner, their savior, and their new walk of life from this day forward. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross. Thank you for rising up the third day. Thank you for saving my soul. It is in the precious name of Jesus I take this blessing. I receive this gift of salvation. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you're new in the faith, if you've recommitted your life or if you're struggling, feel free to reach out to me. The email address is at the bottom of this track channel. Traveling Grace, the number four, the letter U at gmail.com. Traveling Grace for you. Again, it's on the YouTube channel. Feel free to reach out. That's my personal email address. I respond to any call, any, any, any request that can help you grow in grace. I do not respond to community events. I only respond to those things that can help you grow in grace as a new disciple or as a disciple of God's struggle. Feel free to reach out and I respond personally. May God bless you to hear this moment.